Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Relational to NoSQL Migration, sponsored today by Datastax. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can continue the networking at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Ankit Patel. Ankit is a Principal Strategy Architect at Datastax who has nearly a decade of experience with Apache Cassandra. At Datastax, his initiatives are related to digital modernization and transformation projects, leveraging distributed NoSQL data platforms built with Cassandra. Additionally, his previous roles, he has advised numerous enterprises across many industries, developing distributed software and specialized in financial services. On Kit, and with that, I will give the floor to you. Hello and welcome. Thank you for the introduction. Um, welcome everyone to the webinar. My name is Ankit Patel. I'm a principal strategy architect here at Datastax, and I'm more than happy to um, discuss the topic at hand here, which is relational, uh, which is known as RDBMS, to NoSQL migration. So with that uh, being said, I'm going to the next slide here. And uh, I, I want to pause a bit and uh, sort of set the stage for the next few slides. Uh, uh, we want to think from the notion of, of what Albert Einstein had said years ago. Um, he quoted that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So this is really around the notion that our problem space has evolved uh, over the past few decades and years, and it will continue to evolve. And it's going to evolve in, in means that we may ne we may we may never uh, think through, and uh, we can't be solving the same. Uh, we can't be solving the problems from the same uh, viewpoint uh, that we've been doing in the past few years. Um, we need to evolve the solution space as well. So we're willing to um, open up our thinking box uh, and create innovative solutions to solve the new problems. So, uh, you know, just want to give uh, a few moments here and think through this and uh, going into the next slide here um, is really around, you know, the if you think of the digital era, uh, you, you really think that, you know, over the past few decades, uh, People have started consuming more computer products and technologies, and uh, the internet has really opened up a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, uh, usages over time. And uh, you really want to think that you know, if I have uh, increasing needs to uh, process the data at hand, so you know, years ago you used to write things on notebook, now you write it on um, WordPad or Notepad, and now you you write it on your cloud uh, cloud environment, uh, whether it be Google. Uh, Google Spreadsheets or, you know, some means of uh, Microsoft 365. So things are moving and transforming over time to be more digital. Uh, on top of that, uh, people have adapted to the mobile applications. Uh, before you used to go to the bank to uh, deposit your check, now you can do it through just through the phone. So, you know, the, the increase in uh, the digital footprint has, uh, has led to a new problem space where how do I take all this information from an organizational perspective and process it uh, securely process it in a very efficient manner where you really, uh, you know, the end customer and, and user has that experience of uh, being always available and responsive to the uh, the new need that you may have from a, a, a data consumption and processing perspective. So uh, that's really around the digital aspect of, uh, of the equation. Uh, the second is uh, organizations and users are more data driven now. So you look at, you know, the weather today uh, and uh, you may look at the weather tomorrow. Uh, traditionally, you looked at it that in, uh, on, in the newspaper, uh, then it, it switched over to the TV. Now people are using their mobile apps to look at the weather every hour, every 10 minutes. And uh, you're more data driven. I, I can't make that trip in the next half hour because it's going to rain outside or it's going to snow, snow outside. And uh, you want to, you know, that's driving your human decisions. It's also driving key business decisions in, uh, in many enterprises. So they're more data driven. They want to be able to digest the data at high speeds. Uh, they want to be able to interpret that data at high speeds and they want to drive their next process or decision around that data. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that's just moving data from one to the next, that's uh, around the data-driven aspect of things. And then you have this notion of AI-enabled uh, workflows, uh, which is taking human functionality 
and augmenting that with uh, artificial intelligence uh, or computerized workloads where you know less human interaction is needed. So if you think of uh, you know you typing something on a keyboard, now you can actually uh, voice command uh, the computer or the mobile app to type type it for you. And uh, you know that's really powerful and that's uh, enabling a lot of AI workflows up in um, in the new world. And you really can't you know solve these new problems with uh, the traditional technology that you have chosen years ago. And uh, you know we need to think from a modernization perspective. So having said that, you know the modern era, you, you really need to care about the speed of data. The speed of data mat matters, and uh, some of these silo systems were designed in the old world with RDBMSs, and you know it's really around the sad nature of how they've been designed uh, because uh, the problem space has really evolved today. Uh, the data access in this uh, in the siloed uh, RDBMS systems, uh, you know, can be challenging at times. Yes, uh, RDBMSs do scale. I'm not saying they don't scale, but they have an upper limit of where where the threshold is before your cost increases um, exponentially, or you know they can't simply overnight. Uh, you can't say that I'm I'm expecting uh, 10 users today, 100 tomorrow, 10 million the after. You can't really scale that at ease. And then uh, on top of that, uh, the uh, the old systems are are they have some sort of resistance to change. Uh, you can't change the data models around easily. You cannot you know uh, process the data from one flow to the other at ease uh, without uh, developing some complex architecture and uh, they you know you have these old mindsets of they don't want to change the application stack because you know the business needs are different uh, today but however you know they they've been able to maintain and operate those old systems uh, at ease for a very long time but uh, you, you really not are designing around the new innovative uh, need that you may have tomorrow so resistance to change is a big thing that we've seen with the silo systems and then uh, you know there's lot legacy processes involved. So you may think that you know the, when we're redesigning in the modern era, we may never be able to support the same functionality that we did in the legacy processes. Yes, that is absolutely true. But you need to rethink those uh, solutions that you've done in the in the legacy systems and sort of uh, you know try to mimic that in in the new world or uh, think of new innovative ways of uh, designing these processes in the new world. So you can really take advantage of the speed of, of of the information that you're processing over time. And then the lack of anal uh, analytical data skills in, in the old world. So uh, if you have already been on systems, I guess you can absolutely run anal analytics on it, but the uh, there's a lack of, uh, you know, there's there's a lack of uh, skill in the old world of running those analytics. So you might need to come up with an architecture to do that. So you don't overburden the already systems with the operational workloads that you may have, or, you know, you, you don't have to operate with the reduced capacity set. So you want to ensure that you know you're really tackling the analytical skills that you may have, and that's really driving the uh, the uh, data-driven architecture and the AI workloads that you may have in the new world. So you know, just to think, what what is NoSQL? So NoSQL uh, is is really the future. Uh, it is it is not only SQL database. So uh, it's a non-relational database supports the ability to access data using other forms besides structured query language, which is SQL. Uh, it's designed to be used by cloud applications need to handle massive amounts of data in real time. And it provides the ability to overcome scale, performance, data storage, data model, and data distribution limitations. So the, the relation of scaling, uh, it, yes, you can scale it, uh, you, you can put sharding in there, it scales uh, horizontally to some degree. Uh, there's challenges in uh, you know, scaling that even further and uh, you know, taking advantage of uh, you know, your DR strategies might not be at ease with, with these uh, traditional scaling solutions, and uh, you have to think more in the notion of scaling vertically to some degree as well in the, in the traditional world. In the NoSQL world, scaling is simply adding commodity hardware and scaling more horizontally, and uh, you can really do it across re regions and zones at ease uh, with the NoSQL world. So having said that, uh, just want to highlight, you know, a few key uh, differences between NoSQL and RDBMSs. Uh, some of this, you know, you can argue that it is not completely true, absolutely, but, you know, this is at a very high level, just uh, if you were to compare NoSQL and RDBMS as, uh, at the application stack. So when to use NoSQL at the application stack uh, is when you want to think from a decentralized scalable microservices application um, workflow, and then when to use RDBMS is, uh, it's really around the centralized monolithic applications that have, you know, the need to run in uh, active passive mode and you want to just point to one data center or point to one instance of the database and uh, you sort of want to you know 
get away from this uh, new era of uh, microservices and a decentralized world that's when we think RDBMS is, uh, and the NoSQL is the opposite of that. And then from an availability perspective, it's very easy to achieve 100% availability with zero downtime uh, in the NoSQL world. Uh, in RDBMS, the availability, uh, you can definitely achieve uh, bits and pieces of it, uh, and uh, you might be in scenarios where you have to run active passes or master slave workload. And uh, you know, it's, it's yes, you can argue that in RDB analysis you can achieve uh, similar availability, but it's uh, it's going to be hard to uh, always maintain that. And the DR strategies again, or business continuity plans, might suffer in terms of you know how long will it take for it to become available uh, in in the remote data center or the remote network that, that you may have when you have disasters. And then from a data perspective, uh, you know, with NoSQL. Uh, it's very easy to, uh, you know, sustain low latency on structure, semi-structure, unstructured data at high velocity. Uh, in RDB MSs, uh, it's, it's generally around the structured data, and uh, you it you really need to think you know, what, how much you need to scale vertically and to some degree shard RDB MSs when you when you have high velocity and low latency needs. So, just want to think, you know, prospectively what you're doing with the data from a read-write perspective with NoSQL versus RDB MSs when you're thinking through that. And then uh, from a transactions uh, perspective, NoSQL is generally around simple transactions and queries, um, while RDBMS is around the co complex nested transactions where you have your joins, uh, foreign key constraints. Um, and then, so, you know, NoSQL does differ in, in that space a little bit uh, generally. And I uh, just want to think through, you know, the, the advantages that you're getting in NoSQL when you're thinking through some of these transactions and queries that you, you want uh, supported in the NoSQL world. And then from a scalability perspective, as we discussed in the last slide, uh, NoSQL is horizontally scalable, it's linearly scalable. If you have you know, 10,000 transactions per second today, it's very easy to get to uh, 1 million transactions per second, depending on you know, what the capacity of, of the hardware and, and the number of uh, machines uh, associated with uh, the database, uh, NoSQL database you're deploying. And then uh, the vertical scaling uh, is, is a key thing that you know, RDBMSs are known for. And yes, you can scale horizontally with them, but there's charging involved again. So you just want to think from a scalability perspective, you know, what it offers. So then we think about, you know, the NoSQL databases, and, and then there's Apache Cassandra. So Apache Cassandra is the best NoSQL database of choice. And the reasons for that is that it offers that 24 by 7, 365 day availability, zero downtime. It's active everywhere, it's masterless in nature, and it scales linearly. Uh, it offers that zero login, so you're not bound to a specific cloud provider like Amazon, um, GCP, or Azure. And uh, you, know, you can design a layer on top, and you can really have a NoSQL database that is cloud native to, and uh, have, you can drive that microservice architecture at ease. And then uh, you know, there's global scalability with, with the database. It's the number one choice for of world's largest consumer internet applications. And I uh, just want to reiterate a quote that was published uh, as part of this Apache Cassandra 4.0 uh, beta release, um, which is, which is uh, if you use a website or a smartphone today, you're touching a Cassandra backend system. So just want to reiterate that, you know, Cassandra is the cloud native NoSQL database. Uh, and the reason is that with Cassandra masterless architecture, it is easily, uh, it is, you can easily achieve 100% uptime across uh, on-prem, single cloud, hybrid, or multi-cloud deployment types, uh, which is, uh, and, and then the architecture is really engraved in the technology. So if you have uh, a cluster of Cassandra, which uh, you want to deploy across AWS and Azure, which is a multi-cloud scenario, you can do that at ease. Or if you want to uh, deploy the, a cluster across on-prem and GCP, which is Google Cloud, um, you can do that at ease, and that's a really your hybrid uh, hybrid deployment model where you have on-premises infrastructure um, merging with the cloud infrastructure. So it's really to drive the experiences, microservices, and insightful nature of the application and, and the user experience that you may be interested in um, as part of uh, the deployment model. So just uh, going back to some basics of what Cassandra offers. So Cassandra offers uh, CQL, which is called Cassandra Query Language. Uh, it, is, it has similar syntax uh, when it's when you compare it to SQL. Uh, a standard way to com it's a standard way to communicate to Cassandra clusters for reading and writing data. It's a feature-rich language that allows you to manage the cluster. Uh, it allows you to manage permissions, the roles. Uh, it has JSON support. It has uh, user-defined functions, uh, user-defined aggregates, uh, and then uh, there's a lot of uh, neat things you can do from uh, you know 
putting the table and uh, putting a word clause in. Uh, it's, it's very similar to the SQL nature. And um, an example read query would look like select star from a key space and table where partition key equals a specific value. So if you compare this to SQL, you'll find a lot of similarities. And then an uh, example of writing the data is insert into a key space and a table using a partition key, a clustering key, a value column, and then the values associated with it. So we mentioned the word key space in the previous slides. What is a key space? So it's uh, similar to a schema in the RDBMS world. It is a container for multiple tables. Uh, it has a replication strategy associated with it. An example uh, is uh, there's two different types of strategies. You can read about it, uh, which is simple strategy and network topology strategy. Uh, and then there's a replication factor associated with at the key space level. And then there's the extra thing about durable writes. So if you were to write data to it, it would ensure that it also writes to something called the commit log within, uh, within Cassandra. And then an example of creating a key space is a create key space test with replication network topology strategy. I want to point it to data center one with replication factor one. And I want to set my durable writes to true. So what is a table? So we mentioned what a key space is. So what is a table? So it's the uh, same as an RDBMS table. It contains a primary key. It always has a partition key as part of the primary key. So this is very important. The partition key is a must for the primary key to exist. And then optionally, it can have a clustering key. So this is you know, how the ordering columns are defined uh, past the partition key, both the partition key and the clustering key make up the primary key, but uh, the clustering key define the ordering whether you want A descending or descending. And then both, uh, again, just to reiterate, both partition key and clustering key can be composed of uh, a multi-column uh, primary key. And uh, as of a uh, parameter can be adjusted at the table level, uh, some of the parameters that can be adjusted at the table level is a compaction, uh, compression, DC grace second, and time to live. Uh, these are some subsettings within the table. You can read about them um, depending on, you know, the different types of strategies you may want to employ table by table. And, uh, you know, we have great documentation on our website around this. And then here's an example of how to create a table. So it's a simple create table statement. Uh, test is the key space, sample table is the table name. And then you have a partition key one, uh, which is UID in nature, partition key two, which is UID in nature, clustering key one, timestamp, clustering key two, integer, value one, text, value two, double. And then at the bottom here, you would say, uh, I want my primary key to be partition key one, partition key two, you want to make sure that the parentheses, the inner parentheses here are associated with the partition key. It can be multiple columns, just as this example states. And then uh, you have a clustering key one and clustering key two as uh, the additional components of the primary key, which is the outer parentheses here. And then as we stated previously, you can easily state that, you know, the clustering key can be ordered and you can say that clustering key one, I want to order descending and then clustering key two, I want to order ascending. So, you know, just uh, want to reiterate how much similarity is here in terms of SQL and SQL. Um, just want to ensure that Cassandra does, uh, you know, drive a lot of its uh, user interaction and application interaction through the CQL language, which is Cassandra query language. And uh, again, you know, just to reiterate what is the replication factor. So replication factor determines how many copies of your data are stored in a Cassandra cluster. Uh, each copy is stored in a different node. So Cassandra cluster contains multiple nodes and each copy is stored in a different node. Uh, the replication factor can be defined by data centers that you've set up. So if you have multi data center scenarios, you call it DC1 in the east region and DC2 in the west region. So you can say in my east region, I want three copies. In my west region, I want three copies. So you can easily set up the replication factor at the DC level. And this is a this is a parameter set at the key space level again. Just want to reiterate that fact. Uh, it is uh, controlled by the Cassandra schema set up uh, by the Cassandra server. And uh, replication factor is something that you set up when you set up the key space. And uh, you know you can alter as you have different needs and add different data centers over time. And uh, again, I want to reiterate the fact that replication factor is something that you control from the schema when you create the schema, the key space, and the tables. So then the reason I said that multiple times in the previous slide is that it is at the schema level is that there's this notion of consistency level. So this is a parameter which is controlled by the client on individual queries. 
So you can think of you know, a read operation, a write operation from a client perspective, and each individual query that you're making to the cluster would have different consistencies associated with, with it, depending on you know, what the client wants to achieve with the read and write operation. So you know, this parameter combined with the replication factor can help you achieve the consistency requirement the specific use case is looking for. And uh, some simple examples of different, uh, different consistency values are one, which means that I'm reading and writing to my East data center. And I, at, at minimum, acknowledge back to my client when you think that you've actually written the data to one replica set. And, uh, you know, then the client will be happy from achieving that consistency. And you can see that, you know, one may mean that I'm, I'm replicating my, from a cluster perspective, I'm replicating my data in the East and the West, uh, uh, three in East, three in West. Uh, I want to ensure that I, when I'm writing to the East data center, I want to ensure that the East data center, at least one replica set is uh, return, uh, acknowledging that I've actually uh, written the data there before I reply back to the client. So that's the difference between one and local one. So local one ensures that whatever data center that you're pointing at uh, acknowledges at least uh, one write or uh, operation before uh, it, uh, it goes back to the client. So, yes, it absolutely does write to six locations based on replication factor three on the east and replication factor three on the west. But it, the acknowledgement goes back to the client when, when the first replica within the east data center uh, says that I've actually uh, written the data on, on a right path. And then quorum is, is a little bit different. Uh, so, quorum means that I want my majority of my replication factor, majority of my replication factor across the cluster to tell me that actually gotten the data and uh, before the client actually uh, gets an act back. So you can think of majority just similar to voting uh, in some scenarios. If you have 50%, uh, it's no good. You really need that extra you know, percentage, which is 50.1 or 50.001 to say that I have majority. So it's really around the majority. So if you have a replication factor six, again, you know, the East data center being three and the West being three, in a replication factor six scenario, the majority is not three. It's and it, can, it cannot be uh, 3.1 because it needs to be whole numbers because uh, in instance of Cassandra, it could be up or down, so there's no partial. So it's either three, uh, which is not the right answer, which is 50%, it actually needs to be four. So four replicas need to reply back to the client on the right path saying that I've actually uh, taken the right and written it. So now, you know, quorum might work in your favor against your favor, depending on, you know, the, the network latencies between your east and west. So you may not want uh, the quorum in some scenarios. Uh, I just want to go over each quorum before we talk about local quorum. So each quorum means that uh, in the previous example with quorum, it says that, you know, right to the majority, which is four out of six. So the difference between each quorum and quorum is that each quorum says that within each data center that you know of, which is east and west, make sure you write to the majority. The previous one is just right to the majority replica set, which is six, uh, which is four out of six. So it can be three in east and the one in west. But each quorum says that in East, make sure you write to two out of three, and then in West, make sure you write to two out of three. The total is still four, but it ensures that each data center that you have uh, gets uh, the majority. And then uh, there's local quorum, just like local one, to ensure that you know if I'm pointed to East, I only care about getting the majority in the East before the client gets act back. So uh, you want to ensure that you know you're using this uh, in combination of what you uh, what your network latencies between the data centers are. So you know, most of the time we, we advise from a data stack perspective to ensure that client uh, execute local quorum operations to not interfere with latencies associated with the, with the physical network. That does not mean the data doesn't get replicated to the other side, it absolutely gets replicated immediately. It's just that the client doesn't get the act back, that's all. And there's mechanisms in Cassandra put in place to ensure that, you know, if it did miss a blip of data points due to a, a small network um, outage a uh, few seconds, then it does catch up. So. You can also read about that. Uh, it's a, that's an advanced topic. I don't want to discuss that at this time. But, uh, but uh, what I want to, to um, highlight is that consistency is controllable from the client and I want to ensure that you're driving your use cases based on the different consistency requirements that you have. And all means that, you know, just like I said, it ensures that every single node that you're touching on the right path gets written to uh, before the client gets an act back. So this could be a very expensive operation. And uh, you know you, you may not be able to sustain any nodes down in this scenario. So, so you know, just uh, want to highlight you know what it would look like uh, in the previous slide. We went through uh, the different consistencies, and uh, at the high level, if you have an application stack, you know what uh, would the read and write look like in action. So you know this is a multi-data center scenario where you have on-premises AWS and Azure. 
uh, and replication is three per data center. So, and the consi consistency again is uh, you know per read-write request from the client, and and the application has been uh, running an active-active scenario. Uh, it's deployed across the DCs on a read-write uh, perspective. So you know if you have if you have uh, clients which are pointing to the application which are pointing to DC one now. Uh, then it will write to DC1, not depending on the consistency you choose. And if, let's say, you choose local quorum on the right path, uh, you would write to uh, the data points to this data center as your primary. But at the same time, in the background, it would actually replicate across the board. Uh, it's just that the client application will only get knocked back when it finishes uh, writing to the, uh, the data center that it's pointing to. And that holds true across data centers. So if you think from a DR strategy or business continuity perspective, and let's say you lose your on-prem data center, uh, you can very easily point all of your clients uh, uh, from a load balancing perspective to AWS or Azure, and uh, you know you can run with with the same capacity um, depending on how you've designed the system uh, ground up. So uh, this is really uh, you know highlighting the fact that you can really run active active workloads across the board. Yes, there's some caveats there, but you know generally speaking. Um, this is uh, achievable at ease uh, in a multi-data center scenario. So, just want to talk about you know how can my enterprise get from an RDBMS-based design to a Cassandra-based architecture. So, so one of the key points is that the structured data portion is the key for both systems. So, in RDBMS world and in Cassandra, it's more about structured data. Yes, in Cassandra, you can get away with unstructured data. Uh, but it's the norm to have structured data for both RDBMS and Cassandra. Um, and you really want to reevaluate the need for asset transactions. Uh, so with RDBMS scaling with different shards, uh, asset also becomes some problematic statement when it goes across you know, different shards and across tables and, uh, and different, uh, different rows that you might be uh, transacting with. So you, you want to think, you know, do I really need asset? Uh, Cassandra does not support pure asset. It supports uh, Lightweight transactions, so within a specific primary key, partition key, you can say that I want to, you know, only update uh, this data point or insert this data point if it doesn't exist. But that's only within a specific partition key, uh, primary key within the, within the table. So you want to ensure that you under, you do understand the difference between what your asset capabilities in RDBMS are versus what Cassandra offers. Uh, you want to take advantage of the Cassandra performance. So you want to, you know, if you have the need to join data sets across different tables, you want to move that to the application stack. Uh, you may want to uh, think through, you know, what does joining really find me uh, with Cassandra uh, distributor architecture. You can try maybe do parallel reads uh, and, and join the data when you get it from the application stack, or you might want to do some sort of sequential reads where you get it from table one. And then once you get the data back, uh, you use the, the data points in table one to go to table two. So, you know, so joins are not supported out of the box. You will need to move that to the application stack. Uh, and denormalization and uh, data duplication is efficient. So, you know, you may think that why am I really joining this data with my, I'm storing information related to a person and I'm also uh, storing information related to what car they drive in a different table. So you may want to think about denormalization that you know this data is really uh, related and I would never update one without updating the other or I would never retrieve one without retrieving the other. So you may want to put that into one one table structure. And uh, with Cassandra, you know whether you need to denormalize that data or you need to duplicate that data uh, to retrieve it by different means, uh, it's it's no it's absolutely okay. And uh, you know you have to take advantage of what it's good at, which is the read write speed uh, when you hit a specific primary key. And then you want to ensure that you're choosing an index type wisely. Um, if you have latency and uh, TPS concerns associated with the index type, you want to ensure that you are, uh, you're choosing the index type wisely. Uh, the Cassandra does offer some indexing capability, but you know it, it comes at a cost. You will not be able to achieve maybe you know that same sort of latency or TPS with the same number of machines or nodes. So if you do want to choose from a Choose an index. You just choose it wisely and ensure that you know you're driving most of your use case on the primary key read-write path. And then um, you want to thoroughly plan the data model. So the data model is uh, known to be you know one of the most challenging aspects, and you want to ensure that you you plan that ahead of time and you plan it thoroughly uh, in the in the Cassandra world. So so you know just uh, reiterating the fact around you know the data model of. So in the traditional world, the RDBS is uh, ERD is was a norm in designing. Uh, you had uh, foreign key constraints. Uh, you had 
have indexes associated with in the ERD based design model, and that really goes down to the schema applied at 30 messes. Uh, in the new world, which is Cassandra and NoSQL, you want to think from a query based design model, which is around uh, how am I going to read and write the data uh, so that it's efficient for me to uh, access it when I need to. So Cassandra is really around, you know, hitting that data point, hitting that partition or primary key from a read pad perspective. Um, outside of that, you know, things start becoming inefficient very fast. So you want to ensure that you're thinking from a query based design pattern when you're redesigning from the old world to the new world. Uh, you can achieve some sort of index, uh, some level of indexing, like we mentioned in the previous slide, but make sure that you choose it wisely, that's all. So uh, just to uh, reiterate that in the old world, it's more about the ERD based design model, in the new world, it's, uh, it's a query based design model. So we'll just go into that in this slide. Uh, so what is a query based design model? So at a very high level, you can think of you know, redesigning your application for, um, at a very high level in five steps. So you wanna look at the application as a whole, which is really about deciding the application access patterns to various entities to deliver business functionality. Um, if you have a few simple examples uh, in the medical world is that if you have um, medical related uh, the data, you want to retrieve medical history based on the queries at the application level. And then you have doctor visit queries up at the application level. So then the application level up translates into the conceptual model, which is step two. And the conceptual model says uh, design a mental model of the access pattern. So if you want to retrieve medical histories, then you want to possibly read the surgeries uh, or read allergies uh, and read health conditions. Uh, from a doctor visit perspective, you want to read uh, the notes based on some date condition, read the prescriptions by the drug type, for example or read vitals based on, you know, the different parameters that you may have set on, on reading the vitals based on a date range or based on the patient name. And then the conceptual model is really translating to the logical model. So the logical model is about uh, defining the structure of the data elements based on the query based design. And uh, that's really around, uh, you know, going back to the example, if you want to read uh, prescription information, uh, what, are, what are the data points associated with uh, prescription, which is a patient information, date, drug, dosage, and, you know, many other fields that you may have. And then uh, before you get to the final step, which is a physical model, you want to make sure you go through an optimization path where you say that you want to make optimization on the data access uh, when it does translate into the physical model, which is really, you know, I have a need to uh, read and write information by prescription, but uh, I may want to read by not just the patient, but by the drug type or by the doctor. So you may want to think, you know, do I need to duplicate the data or do I need to create an index on that data point? And then uh, the final, finally, it trans everything translates to a physical model, which is um, build a Cassandra table and schema based on the logical model that we've decided ahead of time and the optimization that we will apply to that logical model. And then, you know, in an example scenario, you may have a table at the end uh, which stores prescription information where the primary key is patient date and then and then on top of that, you want to index uh, possibly on a uh, doctor and drug to treat it by other means besides just the primary key. So, you know, until now, we've, we've talked about Cassandra, and uh, I just want to spend a few minutes about uh, what Datastax is. So Datastax uh, has a product around, uh, around Cassandra called Datastax Enterprise. Uh, Cassandra is, is the key foundational layer to the data platform that we offer. So if you look at all the way to the bottom left here, the foundation layer, which is uh, Apache Cassandra, which is our NoSQL database uh, of choice, um, which offers 100% uptime, zero lock, and then global scale. But however, you know, if you think just Apache Cassandra, it may not meet your organizational needs or your immediate needs, and you, you may want to, you know, make things easier for you from operations and a development perspective. So that's really around, you know, the trusted layer that we offer at DataStacks here, which is around operational reliability. We offer advanced performance, enterprise security, monitoring, and many other things uh, related to our product. And then this, the trusted layer is really around the uh, aspect of that we want to make the operations of the, uh, the database very easy for you. And then uh, the development uh, angle is that, that we want to offer features and functionality from a data sex perspective that uh, uh, at ease you can do multi-model capabilities on your data. Uh, we, you're able to drive those operational analytics, uh, whether it be Spark Streaming or Spark Bad Jobs at ease. Uh, but we want to offer that enhanced search capability. So we have, you know, if you if you want to use uh, solar-based text search, we do offer that uh, type of functionality within our product. Uh, uh, so you don't have to duplicate your data or denormalize your data uh, 
and you can sort of um, say that I have table one and table two um, yeah, with XYZ primary keys, and I want to get the data by different columns that stored in each table, and you can do that at ease using our enhanced search. And, uh, you know, we've invested a lot of time around that, and we have recently introduced a storage attached indexing, which we put in open source Cassandra as well, which is Lucy inspired. So that's taking our some of our traditional search functionalities and putting it back into, into Cassandra. So, you know, we're heavily invested in, in reading and writing the data. Uh, at ease from a Cassandra perspective, and want to ensure that you know we're driving that developer capability around, so you don't have to over-design your data models. And then we have a great feature called Graph Engine. Uh, uh, so we uh, we think uh, that you know we are not a graph database from, from ground up, but we have this additional feature called Graph Engine, so you can do complex entity resolution. So you can go from the patient to the doctor to the drug and traverse through that complex uh, relationship at easy at ease. Um, from a from a graph engine perspective, and uh, that travel flow is possible uh, through the Gremlin API that we offer from a data sex perspective on top of the Cassandra data, which is combined through the graph capability that we we offer within our product. And then on top of that, we uh, we have invested a lot of effort around extensible integration. We can at ease uh, put in a Kafka connector that we offer uh, has been open sourced, and then we have bulk loading capabilities in and out of the database. Uh, uh, so you can uh, take the information and store it in CSV file format or uh, take a CSV file format and dump it back into the database uh, uh, very strategically and maybe use that for your auditing needs that you may have. And then, uh, you know, we just want to highlight that strategically we're really around, you know, making the developer and, uh, and the uh, operator's life easy with uh, capabilities uh, such as a REST or uh, Graph API, uh, GraphQL API or CQL that we, will, we have continued to invest our time and effort around it. We want to make a feature rich. Uh, we additionally uh, we want to make uh, you know the cloud story uh, easy and automation around that. So we have uh, invested a lot in the Kubernetes operator, and we will continue to do that. So you can easily take our Kubernetes operator and deploy Cassandra or DataStax Enterprise at ease on any cloud provider's Kubernetes engine or your on-prem Kubernetes engine. And then that really comes down to you know the uh, the outcomes that you're going to be driving and how fast you want to uh, drive those outcomes from an AI scale perspective, microservice, and the insightful decisions that you may want to drive. So it, it's great that you know there's Apache Cassandra and then there's DataStax Enterprise, but I want to highlight that there's a, this additional product called DataStax Astra, which is Cassandra made easy in the cloud. So you may think from your perspective, I really don't want to deal with the operation and the maintenance of Cassandra. So we are offering Cassandra as a service. Uh, it's a cloud native database as a service built on top of Apache Cassandra. It, you literally have to do no operations. So we want to eliminate the overhead of installing, operating, and scaling the Cassandra database for you. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's uh, backed by the cloud native aspect that we, we back it by the Kubernetes operator that we open source and we actually consume that tool in our product called astra.datastacks.com. And then we have zero lock-in so you can deploy your uh, Cassandra cluster on AWS, GCP, and uh, you know we have uh, full feature compatibility with the open source Cassandra project. And then uh, we also offer powerful REST APIs uh, on top of uh, the traditional CQL uh, capabilities of Cassandra. And uh, you know you may want to take advantage of that from a development perspective because you, you don't have to get get to know what CQL is like if you don't really want, and you can just connect directly to our REST API or GraphQL endpoints that we offer as part of the product. And the best of all this is that, you know, if you personally want to try this, uh, we have a free 10 gig tier for, uh, for everybody. Um, so you, you really don't have to uh, think that, do I need to swipe a credit card? If, uh, you can launch a database on the cloud with a few clicks and you, when you register, you really don't have to put in your credit card. And it's a free tier. Um, and so absolutely, please check it out. It's astra.datastacks.com. And then, uh, so it's great that you know we we talked about technology, we talked about RDB messages, uh, what Cassandra offers. But I just want to go through uh, a, a simple use case that we have in the supply chain world. Uh, so CNS Wholesale Grocer, uh, Grocers has been a client of ours uh, for many years, and uh, you know they've been very happy with the usage of Cassandra. So at, organizationally, what they do is they deliver uh, food, uh, 140,000 items uh, plus, uh, and some some of them being non-food items for over to over many of their clients and they have approximately 50 warehouses uh, around the around the country and uh, they they manage approximately 18 million square feet of storage uh, 
Uh, they have customers like Safeway, Target, uh, Stop and Shop. And then uh, they they had this need, a technical need, where the traditional solutions were slowing down the dis distribution efficiency, and that was impeding their innovation um, within the organization. And that they really wanted the, the technology piece, the technology innovation, to drive business growth. So what was their challenge technically, right? So at a very high level, we understand what business they're in. So the supply chain process uh, was local. Uh, was storing uh, into RDBMSs local to their warehouses. So if you think they had 50 warehouses, so each of the warehouses had RDBMSs uh, deployed there and they were storing information locally to the warehouse. And then there was a business need to consolidate all that and bring it to the central office, all of that data, so the management could be at, at ease for the, uh, for the business uh, folks that were sitting in the, in the central office and uh, it, they can drive it through mobile applications. Uh, the transaction volumes were you know, thousands per several seconds. Uh, and they needed a real-time view. So, you know, it was uh, literally uh, if some uh, warehouse, within a warehouse, if some item were to be shipped from a warehouse to a location to a pallet, they needed that real-time view of all the working parts in, in the manufacturing operations. And then uh, they wanted a data uh, platform which is capable of operational analytics. So, you know, if you think going across 50 warehouses for your operational analytics, uh, that might not serve their purpose. It might be really inefficient for them. So they wanted a data platform that was capable of the operational analytics. So why did they choose Cassandra? So, you know, simply we we highlighted uh, within the slide deck uh, in the past is that Cassandra offers that scalability for them. So if uh, all the volumes can fit on on a six node or a 10, 10 node cluster today, you know, they can easily scale that up to 20 nodes to higher to handle higher transaction volumes. Uh, it offered that low latency to serve their mobile users. Uh, they had high availability, so if their warehouse operations were 24 by 7, they want to ensure they're invested in the data platform that's also well available for them 24 by 7. And then uh, they wanted to ease the development process for their microservices and mobile application, and then they had a multi-DC deployment. Uh, they, they were looking for a multi-DC deployment capability, which Cassandra offers. And uh, again, you know, just to reiterate, it was really around the operation analytics of pieces, so they wanted uh, you know, digest all the information, all the related to the. Uh, sorry, um, they wanted to uh, digest all the information related to the different warehouses, and they want to drive operational analytics uh, to see, you know, where where the item might be stuck, or you know, what what's holding up the process uh, to drive more business efficiency around it. So the operational analytics piece was a very key component of why they chose Cassandra. So, so what are some of the business benefits they saw? So some of the business benefits they saw by implementing this uh, data platform on top of Cassandra was that uh, they saw a five-year ROI uh, projection, which was saving them multi-million dollars. They were able to optimize the management capability of consolidated warehouse operations. So before they had to reach out to each individual warehouse and there was time involved in doing that. So they were able to consolidate all that and, and drive the efficiency in that data pipeline. And the transaction volumes uh, were, you know, thousands in seconds, um, and they were supposed they were able to support 300 plus users and process uh, over 300k records in five minutes uh, at ease. So, you know, the records might translate into multiple transactions as it's hitting uh, multiple tables underneath. So. And then, you know, at a very high level, simply what what is the architecture involved? So you can think of the RDBMSs here over on the top left here as uh, the different warehouses. Uh, they were uh, pushing that information downstream to uh, Spark Streaming and uh, to some degree Spark Patsyal was pulling the databases. And uh, it, uh, what the Spark job did was basically it transformed that data and how they wanted to interpret it in, in Cassandra on, in the primary data center. They pushed it further down into Cassandra and maybe read from it in some cases and transformed it further. And then, you know, Cassandra and Neat would replicate that data to their second data center where they drove more microservices on top of. And uh, that really served their mobile application and, uh, you know, to some degree, the microservices with the Spark jobs uh, also uh, did these insightful reports on the data so the, their management can easily look at that through their mobile applications. And, you know, we do have this uh, case on our website. Uh, you can read more about that. if. If you're interested, I uh, just want to highlight uh, a quote that uh, from CNS demo directly is that we needed an application that was entirely reliable and not vulnerable to unplanned outages because our warehouses were pretty much 24 by 7. So, you know, again, it's really around uh, 
24 by 7 capability of Cassandra and uh, ensuring that you can actually drive use cases that, uh, that you can uh, think from a business perspective or, or personal usage perspective uh, on top of Cassandra. So that's not enough. I just want to go across industries and you know highlight different use cases in the financial services. I don't want to mention the client at this time. They don't choose to be public, but it, it's a mobile banking use case. Uh, it's a very competitive uh, retail banking market. Um, they need to keep up and, uh, with the demand growth in the digital banking uh, space, and uh, they have a high cost. They have a need to uh, satisfy their customers at a very high rate because there's a lot of competition in, in the space. So, and they want to uh, also achieve uh, an efficient DR in the business continuity plan. Yes, they had that before, but it just took you know several hours, and they want to minimize that and reduce that and uh, mitigate the risk around that, basically. So, you know, what was their challenge? So the number of transactions in RDBMS was not easily scalable. So, you know, they had a challenge where the RDBMS was not easily scalable with the number of transactions they were referring to. And the DR was not that easy either. So again, you know, it took multiple hours, but they wanted to reduce that down to as much as possible. And then achieving the latency in terms of metrics was harder as volumes increased. So yes, absolutely it was fine to a certain degree, but as, as the volumes increased, uh, the metrics they were trying to Target in terms of SLA were not easily achievable. And then uh, they want to get away from any downtime or poor experience that would translate into a customer churn. So any, if you think of yourself and you're trying to deposit a check or if you're trying to log into your mobile banking application for your bill pay, if you're not able to do that, if there's an outage associated with it, you may not want to associate yourself with that bank. So just think of it from a consumer perspective. So, you know, why did they choose Cassandra? So, you know, they ended up deploying their solution on three data centers. So, so they absolutely, you know, have that strategy in place for business continuity and DR. Um, they are driving on top of a microservices architecture to ensure that they can run an active active or pa active passive in some, some scenarios. Uh, they wanted to scale the application stack uh, with the database. So, you know, if, if I have 10 instances of my application running today, I want to scale it up to you know, 30 instances of my application, can my database really handle it? So, you know, the database also needs to be scalable to some degree for your application stack to be scalable. And then they really want to achieve the SLAs. Uh, you know, they want to target themselves to be below 20 milliseconds on average per rewrite transaction. And then, you know, the, the DR strategy, they want to ensure it's solid with high availability. So in, in Cassandra terms, if a, a single data center is down in the scenario of two data centers is down, they have a third data center available to handle their customers. And uh, they want to be able to process billions of transactions per month. So, you know, that was really came down to the two metrics of what they were trying to do. And, you know, these are some other common use cases uh, that we've seen um, in the customer space that we have. Uh, so customer 360 is very popular with our graph engine. Uh, we have uh, a lot of use cases on, on, in the payment space uh, where, you know, People process, uh, organization process parts of the payments workflows uh, on top of Cassandra and data stacks. Uh, and then, the, you know, Cassandra is also uh, known a lot for its IoT and time series uh, use cases, which is around, you know, you can think from an e-commerce perspective, your shopping cart experience possibly. Uh, but if you really want to think pure IoT, maybe, you know, sensor tick data uh, also plays a key role there. And then, you know, fraud detection is also important. So. You may be thinking of yourself logging in from your mobile application, but uh, what really happens behind the scene is that that device gets tracked in, in the end organization, and you know that needs to happen at a really fast speed, so you you don't it doesn't interfere with the, your logging experience, or uh, the fraud detection needs to happen that you know this person is not supposed to log in with this device, for example, and I want to reject this login. So and you know we went through the online mobile banking use case. Um, inventory management with CNS we went through. Uh, there's also this recommendation phase, uh, a recommendation by a use case where you can drive, uh, if I have, you know, X products and services associated with uh, customers today, can I actually, you know, digest my data at ease with my operation analytics? I can recommend to, recommend to my customer they may also be interested in XYZ products that I offer for my organization. And then, uh, you know, you can also drive better regulatory compliance with, uh, with uh, with the data you may want to store in uh, Cassandra because again, you can uh, dissect and bisect the data at very high speed and um, you know go through terabytes of data at ease uh, to ensure that you have regulatory compliance in place. Uh, and then uh, alerts and monitoring is, is a great use case. Uh, you know, in the credit card transaction world, uh, if you were to issue, uh, if you were to do an online uh, purchase or if you were to go into a store and purchase something, you get a notification uh, push to your mobile application or your 
text message or saying that um, you made a purchase. So, you know, that those, are, those are use cases you can easily drive on top of Cassandra. Again, you know, just reiterating the global payments aspect of things. Um, there's bits and pieces of the global payments process where you, you want to be available across many regions and across the world globally to ensure that, you know, the system is available for you uh, 24 by 7 so you can drive some key components of the global payment system. Uh, the portfolio management aspect of things, obviously, if you have a portfolio of products, if you have a portfolio of, uh, you know, different uh, customers that you have, you can easily manage them through and its life cycle through uh, a workflow that you want to put on top of Cassandra. And then uh, in in the in the lending space, the loan authorization process can also be, uh, we've seen, put on, on top of Cassandra. And then, uh, again, we went through, you know, in, in the banking space around the authentication fees, make sure that your mobile application um, is logging in uh, and is ensuring that the right device is logging in. So, you know, those type of use cases we've seen very often within the authentication space. So, having said that, you know, I'm going to pause here. I, I want to thank you for joining this webinar and, uh, you know, hopefully you do find Cassandra interesting and, um, you know, please check out astro.datastacks.com. You can deploy for free. So, it's something that you should uh, use and leverage as a tool to learn Cassandra. Okay, well, thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in for you. Um, uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording as well. Uh, so on, diving in here, can uh, relational databases um, be fully replaced by NoSQL? Is NoSQL good for OLAP or any, or only or good for OLTP as well? So again, you know, I want to touch on the OLTP piece. You know, we are known to be your operational um, database which handles high, high volume of transactions. So yes, it is good for OLTP, but you just have to be careful that it doesn't have uh, complete asset capabilities. So you, you need to design, read, uh, go to the uh, thinking board and think from, uh, you know, do I really need my asset transaction? So just think from that perspective, because you know, as you start scaling horizontally, some of the asset means, uh, you know, can uh, burden the way you're trying to achieve that low latency or go across tables. Uh, so Cassandra out of the box just does not offer that at the moment. So you, you want to think from that perspective that do I really need that asset capability? Um, and uh, if you do, then you know you you will, may want to stick to RDBMS uh, in parallel and uh, sort of uh, build a pipeline into the new world where you want to. Um, Serve on top of the microservices architecture, but if you can get away from the asset capabilities and just stick to the lightweight transactions that Cassandra offers, then you know maybe it's the right fit for that use case. So um, the way to design Cassandra appears to be the same at the CDM and LDM. The physical use, uh, the physical use, the uh, uh, Chibotko uh, method methodology to create physical queries rather than a traditional relational PDM. Um, could you provide insight into this design? Yeah, so it, it, you're going to see a lot of uh, common patterns there, uh, but you have to be careful of what you want to go back to that slide deck uh, when you do get a copy of it and think uh, not from the ERD based design model, but Query based design model. Yes, in the relational world, you do think from a query based design model as well, but you know, you can easily achieve those joins and you know, your foreign key constraints very easily. So, Cassandra does not uh, offer that out of the box. So, you, you may want to denormalize the data in some cases. You may want to, you know, think from perspective is, is the index going to do justice or do I really need to, you know, design a new table where I duplicate the data to look up the information? Now, Cassandra does offer something called materialized views that read up on it, uh, which, you know, offers that duplication for you. So, you know, there's going to be some overlap there, but you really want to think from a, a query based design pattern because that's where you will be able to excel your use case and, and the pattern that you want with the horizontally scalable database. And is it possible to know which node the data and replicate physically reside on which data center? Yes, there are some uh, back end commands uh, from an operations perspective. You can use to do that, uh, but at, at a very high level, you know, it's a, it's a predictable uh, hashing algorithm that Cassandra uses underneath to determine which actually replica set actually owns that data. 
and the client knows that in the, in the draft that we offer. Sorry, just to uh, finish on that thought. So the client uh, also knows predictably which uh, which coordinators uh, they are hitting from a Cassandra perspective because it has all that information and that hashing algorithm on the client side as well. So when you're trying to read a partition key, it knows exactly which uh, which coordinator to hit, which uh, which is more likely to be a replica versus not being a replica. I love it. So the world of uh, polyglot storage engines, where it, where is the niche for Cassandra? Is it specific or generalized database for all types of applications? So, I'm sorry, just repeat the first half of the question again. Sure. Uh, the world of polyglot storage engines, where is the niche for Cassandra within that? Is it specific or generalized for all types of applications? So. Cassandra is, uh, we went through the different use cases towards the end, uh, but some of that, you know, if you're, I'm just trying to think from a polygraph perspective, uh, if you, if you have a need to, you know, go across multiple entities uh, at ease, uh, you, you want to have capabilities that we have, uh, you want to ensure that, you know, you do, do you want to take advantage of, you know, complex entity resolution? Uh, so Cassandra out of the box does not offer that, you might have to design that from a, from the application stack, if you don't want to take care of the take advantage of the graph capabilities, uh, but you, it's really around you know also the structure storage aspect of things. Yes, you can store blobs in Cassandra, uh, but I'm going to stop here and ensure that you know if there's any follow up questions related to this, uh, you we will follow up through email as well. And uh, there's a lot of documentation of you know what you can do with Cassandra from uh, the different use cases and uh, you know the different patterns you can try from uh, from the traditional. Uh, data patterns that you've seen. Perfect, and yes, we will um, get some answers for, uh, and if you guys have, we have time for a couple more questions here, but if you keep the questions coming and we'll get those over to DataStacks as well uh, for any questions that are unanswered so that they can be included in the follow-up email. So, uh, uh, is Cassandra, uh, is it one Cassandra is instance or multiple instances for all platform apps? It's uh, so you can think of Cassandra from a platform apps perspective. Uh, you don't need to put all the use cases in one cluster, right? So you want to isolate and mitigate that risk. So you know, the app, from app, platform application perspective, if you want to, you know, drive X use cases, uh, you can drive it on one cluster. You can scale that cluster to you know hundreds of nodes. Uh, but you want to also think from a risk mitigation perspective. Uh, if you're doing the operation yourself, that do you really want to you know put your eggs in one bucket, or do you want to go through that same sort of you know if you have to do an uh, OS level patch or an upgrade, uh, would you have to take the same strategy from a high availability DR strategy perspective? Uh, if you let's say your disk blows out or something right on on a replica, so you, you have higher impact uh, to the end customer that you're serving. So you want to ensure that you're you're driving the momentum through you know multiple clusters of Cassandra, depending on you know the types of use cases that you're serving on top of it. I think we have time for one more question here, and then I will get the other additional questions over to you. Uh, so, uh, what model formats are supported in the multi-model feature? Yes, yeah, so so the multi-model capabilities. Uh, so underneath uh, what we what we offer is, uh, you know, we support the JSON capabilities on top of the CQL language. Uh, you can uh, through through our graph engine, you can drive complex entities. So you can uh, have table one, table two, and then sort of you know connect the tables through edges uh, through our graph engine. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, search uh, capabilities is that uh, if you have a specific table associated with an entity, uh, you can uh, the multi-model is that uh, you can traverse through that uh, other complex relationships that you have on a on a different table and connect that table one at ease through through the graph engine as well. So, you know, it's uh, it's really the aspect of uh, taking the high level entities that you want to uh, store and you can store them at ease and duplicate that data at ease through materialized views uh, or, you know, from the application stack. Uh, so, and we, we want to ensure that, you know, the multi-model uh, designing piece, you want to ensure that you, you don't overdo it. Uh, you do it to a degree where you don't end up reading like 10 different tables versus reading five tables because there's going to be operational efficiencies involved there. Well, Ankit, thank you so much for this great presentation. I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. 
Again, just a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording. We'll get some additional information from DataStax for you as well. Uh, and thanks to DataStax for sponsoring today. Thanks everybody for all the great questions and thanks for engaging in so much in everything that we do. We just love it as always and hope everyone stays safe out there. Thanks everyone. Thanks all, Kit. All right, thank you.